I'm here with uh, Costa Porukov. Is that how I say it? Yeah, Costa Porukov. Yeah. yeah. And he is not only a successful business person, but he's also a, an amazing racing driver. And as you do know, one of the things I really like to do is to uncover people who may just look ordinary, but they do extraordinary things. And so today I'm with Costa and I just wanted to ask him a few questions. G'day Costa, how are you doing? Hi Thomas, I'm, I'm good. So tell me a little bit about you, man. What are you and, and what do you do for a living? What am I? Um, well, firstly, I'm a father. I'm a father of three kids, married to my beautiful wife too. What I do, I own a, a commercial fit-out business. My hobbies are, what we're going to talk about is motorsport is one of them. And obviously, I like to go fishing and hunting and I like to build things. Right. And that's literally... Yeah, you like to be busy. I know that about you. Yes, yes, yes. Yeah, yes. You can't have five minutes of a, a rest. You don't understand the word rest, I think. Um, um, depends. Um, resting from work, but then I find myself um, busy in other aspects of my hobbies. <laughs> so, so what, what is that one thing that you first learned about car racing that you brought back home to your business? Uh, I think the risk side of things. Um, um, we're very, very risk conscious in our business. We were very cautious about what we did, obviously, from the start of our business. So our risk assessment plan changed. Not taking big risks, but understanding what you can do in business, where you can push it. And obviously the friendship and everything else helps. And that yep. that's generally what I first initially took away was, wow, you can go so fast around there. I still remember the corporate day. I took my lawyer for a happy lap. Yeah. And we went around the corner and he was cruising around. I, I, think, I still remember that he never went over 100 kilometers per hour on the racetrack because he never knew any better. And at the end of the day, he was really, really fast. He trusted the engineers. He trusted what the car can do. And he came up to me and he goes, wow. And he goes, I'm going to look at business differently now. He goes, I've always been restricted. I'm not going to take silly risks, but I'm going to look at my risk assessment plan and see what I can do better. Oh, so wow. that's, and, and, and it's good Did you charge him for teaching him a lesson? <laughs> no, I did not. No, I did not. He's a good friend of mine. And, and we've been very, very good friends. My lawyer is my accountant. We're all best friends. Yeah. Oh, well, listen, if they were not very good, uh, you could do certain things with the car too. Yes, 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 yes. <laughs> so so that, that's, that's why it's really important for me to do motorsport, to do shooting and people think, oh, you, you know, you're enjoying yourself. Yeah, but I'm rebooting my mind. I'm meditating. Sometimes you need to appreciate things a little bit more by resetting your mind. And I, I really enjoy my business so much that even when I had two days off on my last day, I came into work and yeah. my whole team was like, it's your day off, what are you doing here? Yeah. Because I actually do enjoy my work now to the point where my work is like my hobby and I'm trying to be better. So my racing is my job now because I want to be better. I try so hard. Yeah. I mean... Um, the chain of thoughts have changed. Yeah. That's that's maybe that side of me that's uh, starting to grow a bit of jealousy against you. It's, uh, mm -hmm. You're never at work, man. You no, have no, a, I work. You have a I nice work. CEO. They, they, he I does work the work. 99% <laughs> of the time when you think about how many days I race, there's six weekends away. Yeah. So I have yeah, six, but six, six the, the, Fridays the, off a, a year, yeah, and um, and that's about it. Besides yeah. a school holiday here and there, I'm ninety percent at work. Now, there's one thing I want to talk to you about you that I don't see in a lot of people. I reckon maybe for the first time in my life, I've met someone more generous than me. I mean, I came to this country when I was twenty, so I didn't have any family here really, besides my wife's family. And so for me, generosity is something that not only was ingrained into me from a very young age, but it's also something I had to do because when you don't have a family, you have to try and develop a family that is not of your own blood, but a family that you can embrace. And when I met you and I saw a dude that was more generous than me, and let me tell you how I knew you were more generous than me, we were running a charity auction where you gave a free drive, a driving day, a corporate day at Eastern Creek in your car. And you weren't around because I think you were, you were traveling. And so your wife was there. And at the auction, she told me afterwards, you call her and said, I don't care what you do, just buy it. Mm. And I'm not so sure about the discussion because you must have said, buy it because I want Thomas in the car. Correct, correct, that's was, true. One of the things that I bought was a beautiful microwave that was worth shit. <laughs> And, and I remember clearly, yes, <laughs> yes, yes, yes. And after the auction that night, in the charity auction, two came up to me, two, your wife, she, and she said, Thomas, I'd like to do one thing. I'd like to do a swap. You give me the microwave mm. and I you give you the corporate drive, which you bought back with your own money mm. of the gift that you gave. Correct. And I'm thinking, hold on, 
are they stupid? <laughs> I, I just bought a microwave for 190 bucks mm. or whatever it was. And he just got his wife to exchange a ticket for 800 bucks against a microwave. But that hit me. And that day, it was a big lesson for me. And it was like, don't think that sometimes you're that generous. Or don't think sometimes that you're that good. There will always be someone way more than you. Now, I'm going to have to ask you why I have you here. Where's that generosity coming from? Well, first of all, I don't see it as generosity. I see it as a potential gift to thank you as well, firstly. And secondly, with the experience from my lawyer that gave me that one-liner, I notice that you run a big business. You run a big franchised real estate business. And I wanted you to have that experience. Since you are the leader and you do these amazing speeches to everyone, you drive people, you teach, you train, it's something that maybe I can share to you. So I told to to make sure not some random person won it. Yeah, that's because right. I saw more value in me having a day with you to see what you can take away from this motorsport experience. Yeah, but let's forget about just me, man. Mm. I, I see it's not just me. I see with everybody else. I see you with like even David, mm -hmm. you know, so, uh, who, who works for you. I see the things that you do, and and I see the things that you do outside. I mean. What, what is it? Is that generosity, how Generosity, you... generosity. Yeah. My wife was sick. She was very, very sick. She had cancer. The doctors gave me horrible news. She was pregnant with my son, Sasha. Right. Yeah. So what was it? She had Five cancer. years ago? Five years ago, yep. yes. Five years ago. Five and a half years ago. She was, um, the doctor said that to abort the baby. Yep. And never to have another kid again could maybe save your wife. But we opted not to do that. Wow. And you go through the pregnancy and go through all the treatments while she was pregnant. I didn't know that. It was it was very difficult because my wife had two kids yep. from a previous marriage. So I was thinking, wow, I could lose my wife and raise three kids to myself. I think I was at the lowest point of my life. I'm not a violent person. My wife just finished having surgery. She had a breast were removed. And I was handing over a project on the same day. I was emotionally broken. Yep. I remember going to the toilet crying heaps of times through the day because I felt like I had to be on site. And um, in a non-perfect world, there were certain issues on site and um, the site was delayed by a day or two and I could feel the stress and fell apart. I fell apart I remember someone pushing me very, very hard and pointing the finger and I grabbed his hand and I pushed him back and I broke down, I broke down. And when the client spoke to me and I just told him the story, yep. he told me, go to your wife, to hospital. And I realized that was my lowest point and I never ever want to go there again. Oh. And I realized what makes me as a person is to be me, and that wasn't me. That wasn't me at all. Me was trying to make people feel like they're on top of the world. And, and what's wrong with doing that? What's wrong with sharing a bit of love? And I noticed after that, my wife, she was the most positive thing when she was sick. Coming home from chemo, always smiling. Going to the hospital, we had private health fund. She wanted to go to the public sector. She dressed up in high heels. My wife bought about maybe 50 to 100 wigs she was a blonde lady, she was a brunette, she was whatever. All the beautiful clothes she wore, beautiful scarf, sunglasses, iPad. She had a laptop and she was <laughs> going there to the chemotherapy ward dressed like that where everyone else was in a gown and a beanie and I called it the deaf ward because you walk past the chapel first and then you see the priest praying with someone that's going to die and then you go to the chemo ward. Are you serious? And it was very depressing and my wife, gave me the energy to be happy. And she always tells me that she's never ever been sick to the point of death. She always taken it as like, it's it's a runny nose, it's it's a, a headache. And that's how she saw it because she was 50% cured from her mental strength of being happy. And I guess I've, I've always been stressful in my business previously. If you know me in the past, I've always at times, you know, had breakdowns. From that day onwards, I was the happiest person, I guess, mm. with the strength of my wife and, um, and her to get over this cancer where the doctors gave her you know the the, the the high probability of not not being around and and she's been a, a bright light in my life so. mm. wow what a great story so so from there you had a bit of that sense of gratitude towards everything in life mm. yeah i appreciated and life i see yeah and people a lot more and i see i see too as well she uh, she came out of that and now she just want to take on any challenge mate bungee jumping without without the rope that's yeah, what she yeah, wants yeah. to do we, we had we, no rope man <laughs> I don't know about no rope, <laughs> but we had our bucket list. Like, you know, I still remember writing our bucket list. It was like three, four things. It was very minimal. Yeah. 
name. I still remember. Going to Europe, going to America, and the Northern Lights, or whatever it was. Something very simple. Yeah. And now our bucket list. Because we realise life could be taken away from me, and our bucket list is like 40 points long now. Right. And, and that's another reason. And that helped with business as well, like, you know, driving hard and making sure things are done on time. And, and, and me being the um, BDM role of business development manager now, and just if I win work, and the business is sustained with work for X amount of years, I'm free to take some time off. So we're ticking off this bucket list, I think, which is very important in life. People to live a little bit more. Yep. And I always use the definition, why are we here? Why are we on planet Earth? Why are we humans? Why are we breathing? We're here to live. So just live a little bit. Mm, yeah, that's, a, that, that's one thing that I see around you guys. And I want to say this, all right? I went to one of your races in, um, at Eastern Creek. And I don't know where the two told you, but she said to me, Thomas, you may need to talk to him at the beginning of the race. And I think it was after two of your races where you had a no score and, and, and a few incidents in mm. Bathurst and, and the first one. And I thought, all right, I'll, 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 I'll do what I can. And I remember very quickly, you took me in your the caravan and you, said to me, you, you came quite blunt to me and said, right, Thomas, this is how my head is. <laughs> where, where is it, right? Mm. Yes, yes. And, and I, I still remember, I saw your eyes just change uh, after we had about a 10, 15 minutes talk. And here's where your freaking generosity keep on going, is that since then you freaking have flown me to Phillip Island and uh, to Queenstown just, just a few days ago, we were in Queenstown. And you don't know this, man, but I had to tell you, right? Mm. I, I had to say that there are times when I feel bad being there because I'm going, I'm of no use, the bastard. Why, why, why would I be here? Because I can't be somewhere when someone's paid for everything mm. and I can't be of any good use. And do you know in my head, I'll tell you now, out of this, I had things prepared in my own head in case he said, I just need you to now help me find that full speed in the parabolic, for example. Mm. I would have done an exercise on you. I, mm. I had all that shit, right? But I had to wait for you to ask. And I have to say, man, your generosity, and, and I, I get that. You, you guys have gone through a horrific kind of experience in your life. And the decisions you've made, it's just, they're just crazy. People don't realize it. I do, because I see it. The, the, the realization of, we're here for just one lifetime. Mm -hmm. Let's make the best of it. And I see two doing that. I saw it when she was in, in, in Queenstown. Mm. And, and the generosity you have that is, you know, no, no the, the money here, if, if we can't just share it with the people we love around us, what's the hard work for? There's no point for that, you know? And I see all of that. But still, man, there's people who say, God, make me a millionaire and I'll be generous. They become a millionaire and they are even more stingy, right? So, True. and I've True. been around these people, so don't take this for granted, man. Mm. These are big stuff, right? Mm -hmm. And. I just wanted to say it now, um, that's the one thing that about you that inspire a lot in me. Oh, well, that's good. Is that sometimes when I say I'm generous of my time, generous with what I can and give and and just give nice. as much. Man, I've, I've have now in my lifetime seen someone who's done way more than me. Yeah, but it's different, Thomas. You gave me a different aspect in the way you describe of training people. And I called it either tuning a car, tuning in the engine or the, the setup of a car to be quicker. You tune someone's mind. And I saw value in that. And I remembered my, my last race last year at Eastern Creek. We had a chat. You were busy. You couldn't make it to the race. I had just my big accident at Eastern Creek uh, where I broke a rib. Yep, I remember. And that was um, only eight weeks. And I needed to get back in the car. And you gave me simple words. Just enjoy yourself. Go out there and just enjoy yourself and do what you do. Oh. And I deleted all the thoughts in my, in my mind about the accident or trying to do something more that I'm maybe not capable of doing. And I just enjoyed myself. I, I raced that weekend. And you rang me up and you go, how'd you do? And I said, yeah, I came first. It was my first ever race. <laughs> well, I came back in the car and I just drove. Didn't think too much. And I really did enjoy myself. Mm. Now we're getting into something, as you do know, uh, one of my heroes, Ed and Senna, not mm -hmm. only, and he's, he, he's a, uh, a hero of mine, not only because of his racing skill, but also the generosity he had outside racing, right? Like today, uh, talking about it, he's got a full organization who after 20, uh, now what is it, 25 years or 24 years of, mm -hmm. after his death, is still sponsoring thousands of children of the favela to play their favorite sports if they just went back to school. So that's why he's my hero. So I want to just talk to you a little bit about now the racing here. 
I mean, the sport that you're doing, do you have a special license for this? Uh, yes, so um, obviously when you do um, any type of motorsport racing, there's a CAMS license required for it. You do an OLT where they um, monitor you at the start to make sure you're, you're, you're capable of driving a race car, obviously, and, and doing the basic stuff, uh, braking, turning, and getting out of the car in an emergency situation. And um, they put P plates on your car, um, do a couple of races, and you graduate, and, and you go start racing. Right. Yeah, and so, yeah, so you do need a, a license. It's monitored, it's controlled um, because there's all, all the dangers of the sport. And yeah, so it's, it's okay. very, very important. I mean, obviously, I have spoken about you to many of my friends. What kind of skill do you need? Because they all want to get in the car now. But I, I sort of said to them, no, hold on, mate. Skill? Yeah. So the best thing to do, I feel, like is do a drive day. Do, do a corporate day and see if you can handle the G-forces, if you can handle the, the basic stuff of motorsports, right. speed, braking hard. Yeah. Once you can handle that, the best thing about these cars we drive, they, they're amazing cars. They're a purpose-built race car. They're easy to drive for an average person. They're easy to drive. So you could be driving at the back of the field after a good few test days and, and good training. But you gotta be committed and you gotta be able to delete the thoughts of work and concentrate on motorsport. Because the minute you start thinking about, I oh, wonder if that was sold, or I wonder what that person's doing. If you do that for a corner, you're gonna crash. Mm -hmm. And you're gonna mm -hmm. crash hard, and you're gonna hurt yourself pretty bad. Mm -hmm. And that's the best way I switch off, is to do motorsport. Okay. Mm. So what, what are the skills do I would I develop along the way? if I would start to do racing, for example, as a professional? Well, there is a bit of fitness involved. So yeah, so obviously shit, you no way for me anymore. <laughs> a bit of fitness, I did say a bit. Um, and it's, it's these, this, the most what I'm involved with, majority of the field is all business owners. They're all directors of companies, or, right. um, and, and they're all there trying their best. And with a good engineering team and a good um, track support team, most, I, I would say this, most people would get to the pointy end if they try. And that's the best thing about it. That's the best thing about it. It builds confidence. The team gives you confidence because it gives you parameters and you work within those parameters. Yeah, but you don't just race with like company directors. If I can recall, you've had done something with against Danny Ricardo, isn't it? Uh, not me, one of my cars. Yes. One of my cars, um, uh, we did Top Gear. Um, it was one of those um, races where the, the Red Bull Formula One car had to lap you in five laps. Yeah. And um, there was a MotoGP bike uh, with, not Casey Stone, no, yeah, one of the Mo uh, MotoGP riders. Yeah. There was a V8 supercar, there was a GT car, and there was all these gaps everyone takes off. Right. And my car was one before the Formula One car. And it, in, in a controlled atmosphere, they had to overtake you in five laps. And, right. Yeah. So that was a little bit fun. Yeah. Meeting Daniel Ricciardo. So that was not just company directors, right? You guys among peers. <laughs> I guess so, but that, that, that was m more for for marketing and TV and, and everything else. Huh? But Daniel Ricardo did come down to my garage and, and ask me what the hell was in that car because um, <laughs> he struggled to overtake us down the straight. <laughs> that was the only point, but obviously the Formula One car is a lot faster through the corners. And it's just when we came around the corner and we put our foot down, we have a lot of grunt in our car. So pretty fortunate for that. So, so let's look at this. When, when you do a racing uh, weekend, it, what goes through your head? Coming from you is just to enjoy myself, be confident of what my abilities and understand where I need to be. Um, I think, yeah, it made me read a book once and to understand what um, all the top drivers in the world and what they experience. And I feel like the day I won my first race, it is true and it's 100% true, things slow down. When, when you're on top of your game and for me as a non-professional driver, I felt that the same way. Things slowed down. I could, in that short microsecond of time, I could have a conversation to myself and tell me, you know, what's gonna happen. Well, wow. And I enjoyed the race because, um, yeah, so after the lap four or lap six, I overtook all the radicals and there was two prototype cars, which is a different field, I overtook them. And I led the race till, till then, which was great. I really enjoyed it. So, so just take that thing here into business. Do you sometimes, obviously now you can slow things down when thinking about your business, but do you think that sometimes some people can overthink business? I guess people can overthink um, their business model and, and that's why they're very uh, cautious about their actions. Yes, it's true. But if you understand your model, you understand your business, you understand your competition, you understand your field, it's, it's a little bit easier to perform better. And I still remember clearly someone asking me a question once describe your business. And I drew a line across a whiteboard marker and I write start to finish what I did. 
<laughs> and simple dot point like and I, I said above was on site and yep. below was what's happening in the office and I did a timeline from start to finish okay this is my business from start to finish yep so and and I described it within 30 seconds so um once you understand your business to that point I think it's it's you just have confidence now while you racing though on a racing weekend like we just finished here now in Queenstown in New Zealand is there a mind game happening among among competitors, drivers? yeah, yeah. There's always some some race chatter that we try to get in into each other's heads to, to try to get them off guard. Um, what kind of mind games ha- do you reckon happened this week? So, so I, because I'm, I was there, I could see some of the mind game, right? <laughs> but but I couldn't really say it. Like when you would go and hug one, the other one was looking. Oh, so oh, so it's, it's all about trying to get in each other's heads. I wasn't in the running for the championship. It was the last round. It's a big race, so yeah. Playing, talk about positioning. Talk about what uh, certain um, scenarios, uh, what would happen if that person did something, or if that person braked late or got in the way. So we're just trying to get in each other's way. But when when you're out there, that's all thrown in the bin. Yeah. So you just drive your heart out because I wasn't in the front of the mix. I didn't want to. I just wanted to finish the weekend on a good weekend. I had a game plan was to get at least one third place. And when one of my um, young gun, well, one of the young gun drivers, Mitch, he had a car problem, I knew all I had to do was finish third and the next race finish fourth behind him and then I'll take third in the round. And that's that was my goal because um, getting in the way with the top two guys, it's, it's, it's another a risk assessment. And I, I just wanted to have some, like, you know, a downtime at the end of the race and spend it with the family rather than putting the car on the wall, potentially. Mm-hmm. Yeah, just controlled my risk and just enjoyed it rather than trying to win it. I guess. Yeah. I mean, I, I don't want really to, to uh, put you in the position that you don't want to answer, so you don't have to answer this, but I've been around three races, yeah? yes, and I've noticed the first guy, the second guy, and you are in the same team. Correct. And I, I know that when we were in Phillip Island, there was already a manufacturer of first and second had to be a certain thing, and at one stage you were leading the guy who actually ended up winning. Mm. And you were told to let him pass. You yes. were told a few times to let him pass. And I know that because I, I, I stood that over the garage. Yeah? So w- what do you think about this? Because you're going, hold on, I'm here to race. And here's the garage telling me to push over for a second. But hold on, if I let him pass, I am being disloyal to number one. If I don't, well, I'm now being disloyal to the garage. There was that one moment, I have to say, of the three races, where I still have a question, and why we're here now, we don't have to put this anywhere, but... It's, it's, it's a very simple way to answer that. I'm, I'm not in the lead, so why should I affect the end results, number one? Number two is I'm not a professional driver. We're all here to try and enjoy ourselves as well, so... I get that, but that's as simple as that. However, mm. if I was to go back in the timeline, I'd say mm. that maybe that affected the outcome of the championship. Okay, I'm going to put it in a real estate term. I don't have enough money yep. to buy the property, but I'm bidding anyway. I'm up in the bid, so why should I do that? I understand, but you don't have to compete with two other guys. You, it's either you want win it or mm. you don't want it. So we're talking about the end game here. So the end game was the championship. I was nowhere near there. And the team gives you a direction. It's up to you to take control of that um, advice. It, it is just an advice. Let him pass. You don't have to let him pass. Isn't it the moment when you do a bit of a tail thing? Fuck multi-21? I'm not a professional <laughs> driver, again. So I, I, it's different because I'm not driving for money. I'm not driving for a career. It, it is, at the end of the day, a hobby. And why should I do that? Because it's not me. As simple as that. <laughs> Sorry, man. That was a curly what I had to put in. Now, how, how do you feel about your energy level? Because I, I've seen your energy level. You're, you're an animal, man. I, I've seen you. I mean, people do not realize who you are until they've spent a weekend with you, right? Whatever you are on here on the podcast, I, I don't know, man, you're, you're pretty serious, but they don't really realize who you are. I've seen you finish your race. Mm-hmm. All right, I'm, I'm gonna say it, all right? Yep. So don't Go feel bad. Say it. I, I have seen you bounce like a ping pong ball in the car all the way to the airport at Phillip Island, mm-hmm. right? When all of us who haven't <laughs> been driving the, any part of the weekend we were tied. <laughs> I have seen in Queenstown when you have finished two sets of 50 minutes of racing 
and you're the only one that's coming home at 1.30 after you've been drinking all night with the entire team. <laughs> and we were in bed, right? Snuggle up. So where is that energy coming from? I think the energy is coming from realizing what life is. Life is, you can be depressed, you can be sad, you can say that there is something that's gonna save you, the world's gonna come to an end, or just be yourself. And myself is to be happy, I realize that. I realize that from when my wife got um, sick. I realize life is to be happy for me, and that's me. And if you don't wanna be happy around me, it's fine. So you just go do your own little thing and I'll do my thing. Okay, so, one last question here. Um, I'm in the world of sales. I'm in a competitive world too, uh, and where I'm selling houses. Mm -hmm. What could be? What would be the lessons that I could learn from racing? Lessons learned from racing is um, try your best. Do not look at numbers and guidelines. I guess because it will restrict you. If the best person's selling six six houses, you're going to push yourself to six or seven. If you just push pull that aside for a moment, and if you can drive yourself, maybe you sell 10. Maybe if you got to six, you'll be less energetic to sell seven, because you're right up there. Try not, maybe not to compare yourself to stats, right. but try to be your best, the best you can. Um, you obviously have a model, stick to it, and keep on pushing all those points. Okay. I think that's very, very important. Right, okay. Well, Costa, I want to thank you for today. Thank you, uh, thank and, you for having me. And I, I had to say that having you as a friend in my life has been very important to me. Oh, um, that, so that means a lot to me. And this, this interview actually really means a lot to me, man. Thank you very Thank much. You. Thank you. Thank you for right. having me. I couldn't help. Um, I had to make a phone call to Costa right after the, uh, the uh, World Time Attack event that happened at the uh, Eastern Creek in uh, Sydney, New South Wales, Australia. And I just wanted to uh, congratulate him on uh, his fantastic win in the uh, Pro-Am class. Hi, Thomas. How are you? Excellent. How are you doing? Really well, thanks. Man, what the hell happened on the weekend, huh? Congratulations. Thank you very much. Um, we are racing on the weekend. Yeah, I know. So it, what it was that? Uh, world Time Attack? What is that? So it, it's the best way to describe World Time Attack is extracting the best lap possible out of your car for one lap only. Yeah. Um, no, no fuel restriction on how much fuel you can put in the engine. There's no uh, restriction on force power. So you can put as much power in the car. The only restriction you have is the tyre and the grip of the tyre that, that you have. Yeah. So... That's so what, what, what's the grip of the tie? They, they, they racing ties one? Yeah, they're, they're semi-slick. They're, they're still a DOT-approved tire for the street. Oh, I see. Um, but the cars are getting closer and closer to the, um, the good old A1 GP time, which is the Nico Hockenberg time, of, uh, which is more than 10 seconds a lap quicker than a V8 supercar. Yeah, so, the, um, so what is it? The World Time Attack then is, that, that's really regulated by the ties. I mean, you, you can only go as fast as the tie can handle, right? Pretty much so, yeah. Uh. Pretty, pretty much so. You're still bound by the standard width of the car, the length. There is, um, there's all these rules on how wide you can go. There's rules to control that. It's got to be street fuel yeah, that man. you can buy from the pump. So there's no special fuel. So then with the tire size, there's only one tire size restricted. Yeah. What is which that? It's an 18, 18 inch diameter. So your, your, your brakes are restricted as well. Oh, shit. Okay. Mm. <laughs> your suspension pickup points have to be through the standard car suspension pickup points. Yeah, so, uh, yeah. So, so there are rules in there to, to to limit how wild you can go. Yeah, I the saw. The cars are still very, very wild. Yeah, I, I I saw you win in the pro am, but then something happened afterwards. I saw some what is it uh, blowout. Yeah, yeah. So what actually happened? The, the tires have a load limit. The, these cars are highly aero car, so there's a lot of downforce. I would be quoting a number uh, over three tonne of downforce, so the tire is being squashed yeah. to the point where the tire is actually delaminated. The actual grip uh, of the carcass is delaminated. <laughs> so we push it to the extreme, right on the edge. But on that flying lap, when the tire exploded, we're already for the heat cycle through the tire. So uh, the tire only lasts one lap. Yes. The fuel <sighs> tank only lasts one lap. Oh my god. So there's not much fuel. So after a warm up lap yeah. and then a flyer, so you go full full speed and then the cool down lap yeah that uses up most of the fuel in the tank yeah so we have to obviously take it easy and slowly and, and come back in yeah another analogy to use is the drag car yeah with big brake and an aero and a wing and spoiler and yeah. all that type of stuff yeah i saw a lot of work uh, what is it uh, on facebook i saw a lot of work on the car even just before race day there's always work to be done. There's um, the conditions of the racetrack is changing. The, uh, my lead engineer, which, which is Big Louis, he puts a, a setup in the car. Yeah. 
which is obviously changing the pitch of the front splitter that gives us different grip levels for different areas. And Louis looks at all the data from all the sensors in the car and from all these sensors gives him a, a feel of what, what the car's reacting and, and through certain corners. And if we're struggling to, for a certain corner, he might change the setup. Right. And we'll generally change the setup every time we went out. Uh, how did you come to pick up uh, to pick that car? I've always been a, a Mitsubishi Evo fan, a, a big Mitsubishi oh, Evo fan. I see, and I see. Um, yeah, so it's got a good following in the um, performance modification um, side of cars. Yeah. What what, what was what was more uh, obviously the uh, most important thing was the aero, yeah. The aero, yeah, the aero. And and is that is that why you got uh, Japanese engineer? Uh, because the it's day a Japanese well? car, yeah. uh, it made sense to go with a Japanese company. There, there are obviously other cars that have like X Formula One styled aerodynamics. Um, from Renault, from Caterham, and, and also, uh, yeah, Barry Lockwood from um, McLaren as well. So they, they work on the MCA car. Yeah. Sammy works on the Porsche, which he's an ex Caterham uh, Renault aerodynamicist. So there, there are some, some big names involved in motorsport, but we use a actual a wind tunnel. So the car, we have a one to one scale model in Japan. Yeah. So we put the car through a wind tunnel and um, got some guidance from that. Oh, and that's that crazy. Car. I can't believe you, mate. Three weeks ago, I was with you in Queenstown where you were racing radicals. Yeah. And then suddenly you get out of there and jump into something totally different. Yeah, yeah from an open wheeler to, to a tin top. So. <laughs> Are you crazy? Uh, I'm not, uh, I, think, I think it's a challenge. So yeah. All these things is a big challenge for me. And, and, and it's uh, exciting. Get my blood pumping. Yeah. I mean, are you, some yeah. people well, you've been it. in the race car before with me, so you, yeah. you can sort of experience the um, adrenaline rush. Yeah, I don't need to be in um, the race car with you, man. I just have to be in your, your AMG. I know what it feels like. <laughs> so what's next, man? What are we doing here? What are you doing now? So, so the, the, the cars um, are going to get just a, a quick checkup. Put all the spare parts, do a provision yeah. check. I've got a container all, all um, rigged up, ready to go to Japan. So in three weeks, the car gets all packed up. So we've got two containers going to Japan. One container is all the tools, parts, and, and bits and pieces like that. Yeah. And the second container will be the obviously the car. Yeah. So so what what's happening in Japan? We're racing in the Japanese time track. <laughs> I gotta go get I gotta go get that lap record, which has <laughs> evaded me. Last time I was there, about. Eight years ago, the engine we broke a camshaft. Yeah, it was very very sad. Yeah, and then we had um yeah one of the intercooler hot hoses snapped, so we never really had a decent run there. So what what's the uh, what's the time that you're looking for this time? Um, a fifty second lap time in in, in Suba. The, the the racetrack is Suba. Right. So yeah. So can can we follow it somewhere here? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'll I'll send you a link. It's it's a, uh, a Japanese open and closed bracket. It's called yeah. Attack. Right. It's a attack event in Suba. So I will send you the link uh, of that. And um, if there is not a a live stream, we'll do a live Facebook feed as much as we can. Oh yeah. Okay. Yeah. Well, that's cool. So uh, after the race, what happened, man? I saw you um, back home enjoying uh, smoked food, smoked uh, meat. The that famous yeah, smoked meat that you keep on, that smoked meat you keep on talking to me about, you know? Yeah, yeah. I've, I've got it all <laughs> wrapped. Um, all the meats are actually good to eat now, so they've, they've dried really well. They've smoked and dried really well. Uh, I've been tasting them over the last four or five weeks. So yeah. Right now, I think it's perfect eating right now, and, and with a nice glass of whiskey, it just suits the um, backdrop of my backyard. Well, yeah, that's a, that's the one so thing that that's, always. That's what I miss. I, I miss that peacefulness. No more noise. No more people around me. Yeah, yeah. Well, that's that's the one thing that I know about uh, people. You know, it's the way one person does something is the way they do everything. So I know that even the way you smoke your meat because they, that's your own meat, right? Correct. Yeah. So <laughs> so the the way that you smoke your meat, I had to say it's probably uh, a one again. I, I think this year I've, I've, I didn't smoke it. Uh, we, last year we smoked it for about six weeks. This year I smoked it about four weeks. Yeah. And then I dried it. I was really cautious of drying it. So it's not o over smoky. I think last year was I had some comment that it's a little bit too smoky. So I've actually listened to my what my friends said. Yeah. I, I like it personally a little bit smoky. Yes. But this year I think it's perfect. So I'm, I'm a little bit excited oh, to, man, to share it with my good close friends. I saw it. I saw that picture. I thought, man, this is quality. I can tell.
and, 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 unless you fo- unless you photoshop the picture you guys evening a, a evening with you after <laughs> after dinner a little small nightcap and just some chilled meat so it'll be nice yeah so and and so what what's after japan you working after as well japan, aren't you I, working aren't I you going away home, yeah I've, i've got i've got china i've got hong kong india and china which is our our new venture overseas yep we're, we're just looking at factories at the moment so that's what we're doing yeah maybe one of these days mate we're gonna have to organize maybe some corporate radicals or something so that some of our yeah, friends yeah, can so, uh, um, maybe participate you know yeah i think i think um like whoever you choose to come out it's always a, a good experience to come out and and see what your mind can push you to do yeah even though sometimes you think it's not not in your comfort zone it's yeah. important to, to understand the safety of a race car and then performance will come out after that generally we, we've got to book a couple of track days next year just for our company now because these drive days are getting a little bit out of control <laughs> So, yeah, we're going to have the whole track to ourselves and it'll yeah. be just easier. Well, that's nice. Hey, listen, just going back to uh, radicals versus a car, I mean, how how does someone set himself the way you do? I mean, you you, you were running the, the last round of the championship uh, and you did mm-hmm. uh, P3, which is uh, amazing. And mm-hmm. and then from then on, you have to change the way you drive, the way you brake for I think, a world-time I think, attack. I, I, think, I think it's like comparing two racket sports. It, You play squash, which I play a lot of sports, as you know. Yep. I'm not really good at most of it, but I understand the the concept and the um, mechanics behind it. There's such a thing. Yeah. But see, playing squash is one style of swinging the racket. It's more like a cut shot. Yeah. And tennis is more, a lot of times, a more top spin. So you just understand when you pick up that racket or you jump in that car, you know how to drive it or you know how to build up to that driving style. Yeah. Right. But don't, don't you find it sometimes you, you just... Confuse yourself? No. Not at all. Not, mm. not at all. You're there's amazing. golf, there's cricket, there's... Uh, I play a lot of sports. And yes, you don't jump in a car and you... For me, I don't bang out like, like the fastest last time. You build up to it. Yep. That's what we were doing before the, the tire blow out. I had two more sessions and I was confident that you know, I would have beaten my last year's time. I was a second and a half off that, but the car would have beaten last year's time comfortably, like yes. really comfortable. But yeah. at the same time, you have a program, your engineer's got a, a driver's brief that you follow. Yeah. And... And the program is to do, you know, you got the, your target times. You're, you're ticking off these boxes and you progress. And I'm sure in squash you don't go out there and smash the, the number one qualifier in your in your group of people. Yeah, You build up to it slowly and, and that's what it is. Now, what, one other thing that I say to a lot of our young guys when they do training with me is how much drivers actually train. The people think that oh, they, wow. they, the only training they do is when they're in the car. But you do simulation um, in b- yes, before yes. race day? I, I, do, I do thousands of laps. Um, and this gets you mentally ready for what year to be in as well for me especially um, going out there you know, like um, for example at um, Queenstown turning into the bus stop it's a fifth year turning you know you just know what years you're in and that helps that this direction yeah. even though I can close my eyes and drive it it just makes you feel a little more comfortable going out there the sim training with the pro, uh, uh, how advanced the programs are it even gives you a little bump on the track so you, you're mentally prepared for the small things that you don't really take notice of Wow. Um, so you start driving So they, they actually, uh, the, the track is scanned and you got all the little ripple strips, bumps and everything else that you feel were a little, they got little shock absorbers in the car that give a little nudge, so it's like a bump. It actually feels fairly realistic these days. Maybe that's the business you should get into, man. Bring back a few sims. Uh Yeah, a few, they're, a few they're, professional they're, sims, you know. Uh, yeah, yeah they're, they're, they're all out there. There's many companies making them there. Mm-hmm. Yeah, they're, they're pretty expensive too. Like a, a decent one, like you know, fifty to hundred thousand dollars for a decent sim. Might as well get a car. Well, then you don't you don't have a team of people when you can crash it. Just you crash it. it. Get a new one. <laughs> 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 yes, it's good training. That's, yeah. that's what it's used for. So one just of like your... you get a, 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 a tennis ball machine, written out tennis ball, that, you know, it's just good training. Yeah. But in, in real life, when you're out there, it's different again. Mm. It's, it's different because you know that if it's an important point, you can hit it really hard. But with tennis ball coming at you, you have maybe, you know, a hundred of them in an hour, whack it as hard as you can. But it's still that, that confidence you get from the tennis machine, ball machine going to the tennis court. Same as the simulation. Simulators, it gives you that confidence when you go out there. You jump in the car, you don't have to think, you just go do your thing. Man, you have a good trip in Japan and all the best. Okay, thank you, Tom. All right. Have a good win.